But over the past few weeks, one of the things that has been on my mind has been one of the crises that I'm observing, not only in the world, in America, in our community, but folks, it's, it's beginning to come into the local church. And that is the identity of who am I? Who, who are we in Christ? Who are we in, in, even for an unbeliever, who am I in relation to God? Now, many will say, will ask the question, who is Christ to you? And that's an interesting question. We'll come back to that in a moment. But the world around us, they have basically asked the question, well, who is God? And remember what Pharaoh said back in, in the beginning of Exodus? When Moses went and says, the Lord has said, who, let my people go. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should listen to him? Now, any of us, knowing what we know about God and knowing the scriptures as we know them, we will cringe to hear someone make that de declaration because we know who God is. And we know that one who questions God and his existence is asking for God's demonstration of who he is. And you can ask Pharaoh, that does not go well. You can ask many other throughout the history of the scriptures that that does not go well. But we're living in a day, and if you've been watching the news, I've been pretty much news deprived for the last, I guess, six weeks or so. And I've gotten some big headings, you know, like the overturn of Roe v. Wade and other things. But for the most part, I've not had much opportunity to watch news. But just in the short time today that I was in the car that I heard some things, I, I'm hearing over and over this challenge of the, I, the gender identity that's going on. And today we're living in an age where identity is becoming a crisis for everyone. You, can't, you, you may get in trouble for calling someone a boy or a girl, a man or a woman. And then this thing of what is a, a mother, you don't say mother anymore, you call them birthing persons, right? Now, I don't think I'm going to make that adjustment anytime soon. The bottom line is, where do we go to define what our identity is? And as a church, we're beginning to see the church try to become more socially acceptable and redefine some of its terms and even way of thinking, and in some cases, even their theology, to adapt to what's being accepted in the world. For example... There's a church not far from here, many years ago. They began to change their, it's a Baptist church, began to change their identity. And began, they called a woman pastor and then a, a woman associate pastor. And before long, some of the members of that church began to appearing in other area churches because they had taken the position that they could now accept homosexual persons as members of their church. So then all of a sudden you see the identity, the identity of the family, of relationships, and all these things are beginning to even permeate the churches. You remember a few years ago, I don't remember what year it was, when the for, one of the former presidents decided to make it legal for same-sex men or women to marry one another. And then the attorney general came out that same week and wrote to the major denominations a letter from the Justice Department encouraging them to change their church bylaws to conform to the new standard that had been set for the United States by the president. And you remember we took a Sunday here? It was probably one of the most well-attended Sunday services we've had ever since I've been here. And we said we're going to go Sunday morning and Sunday night. We're going to look at what God says about this issue in the scriptures. And we went from Genesis to Revelation and we showed what the scripture said. But sadly, the church is beginning to adjust, and I'm concerned that, again, it goes back to that question, who is Christ to me? I saw this week an another statement. People say, what the church determines the Bible teaches. For example, what, what did the church determine the Bible teaches about this? And someone pointed out that statement is wrong. The church does not determine what the Bible teaches. The Bible determines what the church teaches. And that's where the authority is. And we come back to this same question of our identity. 
We do not decide what our identity is to Christ. Christ has already decided what our identity is to him, whether we have received him as our Savior or whether we have not. And what I want to do over the next few weeks is we're going to go through a series called Who Am I? And this is in light of what God says who we are. Now I'm going to start off down the road a little bit, okay? Because it's going to be familiar ground for us who know Christ as Savior. For anyone listening to this that doesn't know Christ as Savior, it would be a very valuable lesson Though you do not know from experience what that is, you will know from yearning and a desire to know what forgiveness is, what reconciliation is, what salvation is. So it would be valuable and a strong urging to, to that one who doesn't know Christ to come to Christ. I say that because these messages now are going beyond just these four walls to, in some cases, around the world. And we pray that they will be used by the Lord in that sense. Well, who are we in Christ? Well, let's, in Christ is the first place I'm going to start. Now, that's not the beginning of the story, but I want to start there so we understand who we are right now. And then the next step will be, how did we get here? And then what are some of the implications for the future because of where we are? So let's begin in our lesson. This is, this is not original with me. I picked this up, I think, from one of Rose Publishing's books. And I thought this would be a very good Wednesday night study. And I just labeled it there. And then this week, as I started thinking about this crisis our country's going through about identity, and by the way, not just here, I noticed it in Brazil as well. I thought maybe it's time that we stop and ask ourselves as believers and to an unbeliever the same question, who am I in relation to God, in relation to creation, in relation to the world around me? But then specifically, we're going to begin tonight with who am I in Christ? So as we follow the outline here, no, I do not intend to finish this tonight, this particular one. But we'll get there eventually. But let's begin there at the first point. And this is the, the most critical point for the believer. Not so much who, who is Christ to me. The, the reason I, I make an issue of that statement is because in the world today, and particularly in the church of Jesus Christ, we are seeing once fundamental churches who are now changing their way of preaching. Instead of bringing the people in conformity to God's word and God's standard, we're trying to bring God down to our opinion of him and what we will accept and what we want to conform to. And that is not acceptable to God because God is unchanging. God is perfect. God is the standard. And we measure ourselves by him, not the other way around. But today, if the word of God offends me and the preaching of the word of God offends me and I don't want to repent of my sin or change my attitude towards the things of the Lord, then what I do is just simply go somewhere else where they will not offend me. But let me ask you this. Did that change truth? No. The truth is still the truth. It doesn't matter what you say something is. You can call someone a birthing person. It does not make them a woman or a man, as they seem to choose to be. God said he made them in a certain way, and we're going to see that next time in the, in the next lesson after this one, that he created us, and the Bible says, male and female created he them. And no male that was born a male will ever be a quote-unquote birthing person. They cannot do that. I, I did some research. Find out, have they somehow magically found a way to transplant the parts and no, they haven't. Why? Because God made them this way. But let's go, let's begin where we are, in the church, the believers, and let's start working on our attitude towards God and who we are in him. And first is understanding how we got here as a believer. Ephesians chapter 1 teaches us about our position as those being forgiven. What is it that alienated man from God? What separated man from God? Well, back in Genesis chapter 3, we know the story. And we'll get there in the near future. We're going to look at how man sinned and became alienated from God. In fact, Jesus told the Pharisees there in John chapter 8, You're of your father the devil. They called Abraham their father. They, and physically he was, but spiritually he was not. They called Jehovah God their father, but he was not. Why? 
because they had yet rejected. And we're going to see Sunday in the discourse of Jesus there in John chapter 5. That because they rejected Christ, they wouldn't honor him. They were not honoring the Father. And until we come to that realization that we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, God is not our Father. So to be forgiven is to bring that issue that separated us from God, the sin that Adam committed and thus transmitted to all human beings from Adam till now. We all have the same problem. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So that settles the issue for all of us. The wages of sin is death. God is life. Therefore, we have no relationship whatsoever with God in the sense that of salvation or hope of heaven in the condition in which we are born. So what is, what is our relationship? Well, we're sinners. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So God offers that forgiveness. And Paul in Ephesians 1 verse 6, he says this. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. According to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. God has forgiven our sins in Christ. So who we are in Christ, the phrase in Christ means to be placed in the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. So as a Christian, we are in the body of Christ. Over a hundred times in the New Testament, I think it's maybe around 132 don't quote me on that. It's somewhere in the low hundreds. You'll find that phrase, in Christ, in Christ. The vast majority of them are in the writings of the Apostle Paul. But what he's saying is someone who has been saved by the grace of God, it means their sins have been forgiven. So all, all sins are forgiven before God. God will not condemn me for what? For the bad things I've done? Say, how, how low will God go as far as saving a sinner? Well, we saw that with the Pharisees, didn't we? When they were there in the, in the house and the paralytic man was lowered down through the ceiling tiles and placed before Jesus. And before healing the man, he said what? Your sins are forgiven you. And then the Pharisees and scribes, well, who does he think he is? Only God can forgive sins. And they were right. And he was telling them, the leaders, and the Bible said they were from all over the southern part and northern part of Israel. So they come from all over trying to figure out, what is this Jesus doing? And then when they saw him forgive sins, it was the e equal to saying he was God. Because only God can forgive sins. And he saw, he knew their quandary and their question and challenge in their minds. And he said, what would be easier? To say your sins are forgiven you, which you cannot verify empirically. Or to tell this man, rise up. Take your bed and go home, which only God could do. And so he tells the man, rise up, take up your bed and go home. And he does right in front of their eyes. So he showed them who he was. But the point of all that was he was trying to show them that he was there to forgive sins. So whatever things are there before, the bad things that we have done, the moment we trust Christ as Savior, our sins are confessed, all the judicial evidence sentence against us is forgiven so we're not condemned for the bad things we're not condemned for the good things we've left undone you say well i spent all my life is it no but god will save you at whatever point you repent and come to him but it must be done in a time and it must be done while the spirit is drawing us now will we lose rewards as believers for thing, good things that we've left undone yes but we will not lose our salvation Thirdly, we will not be condemned for the evil things we've said. How many people that I've sat and talked with have, they were, they were guilt-ridden over things they had said to someone and then they died. Well, God will forgive that. He will not condemn us for those things once that is forgiven. And the wrong things that we have thought. Now, that, that's, a, that's a place where all of us are challenged. It's one thing to control our tongue and control our hands and feet and our actions, but our thought life is difficult, isn't it? The things we think about one another, the things that we, it, the reading in of motives, the reading of hearts, and that, that is one of the greatest areas of challenge. 
So what, how do you deal with your thought life and the things that you think? Well, the best way to do it is go to Philippians 4, 8. That gives you kind of the antidote for a believer. And whatsoever things, and it gives a whole list. So they're pure, they're honest, they're just, of good report, and all those things. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, what? Think on these things. Start thinking about the right things. And when these things come to your mind, start meditating on the Word of God. Sing a hymn. Do something that will put your mind on the things that it should be on and not on the things that it should not be on. But as forgiven, Romans chapter 8, verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. We've all seen cases, some, some of you may have actually been in cases where you go to court and you stand before a judge and you stand accused and you really have no, no other answer but to say, I'm guilty, speeding ticket, or other situations. And Have you ever been seen or been in a situation where the judge then says, okay, don't do it anymore? But you can go. There's no fine. There's no condemnation. And that is a feeling of relief that comes at that moment. I remember being in court, not because I was there, but there was someone had pulled out in front of me, ran a red light, and I, I hit their car. It was a 16-year-old boy, just gotten his license. And so I had to go to court because he was underage. And then the, he got up, and the, the officer gave the report. The judge talked to me, and I said, look, I said, he got out of the car, he took responsibility, he acted very mature for his age, and I said, I have no complaints. I said, it was a difficult situation, the sun was in his eyes, and the judge, after he talked with the boy, commended him, and he said, forget about it, and we left court. That's a, that's a, that's a great feeling, but that's a human forgiveness over something that is temporal, but imagine when our sins, all of us have sinned, and we stand condemned before God from the point we are born because we were condemned in Adam, Romans chapter 5 tells us. But when we know that we are in Christ, we are forgiven, and there is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.38, I like this verse, says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. And he goes on to list things. It says, none of those things can separate us from what? The love of God. Why? Because we have now been forgiven. So in Christ, we have been forgiven. So those who, regardless of the past you came from, whether you were a Pharisee and you thought you were pretty good, or whether you were poor old Matthew, Jesus walked out of that house with all the Pharisees and scribes after forgiving the paralytic man. And what was the first thing he did? He showed them just how low he would go. He, he said to Matthew, the publican, who's in his booth over there collecting taxes. You notice in the New Testament they use the phrase publicans and sinners. Well, what's the distinction? Well, the publicans, I guess, in that day were considered the lowest ones on the rung of the sinners. That was scraping the bottom of the barrel. And then everything above that, it, it just summarized by sinners. And where did Jesus start when he tried to show them he could not only forgive sins, but he goes and he calls Levi or Matthew to come follow me. And he left it all. Left, it was a great thing, an arrangement that he had paid a good price to get. And it was very lucrative to him and he could never go back, but he walked away and followed the Lord Jesus. But how low will Christ forgive? He will, he will forgive Anyone who's a sinner who will recognize he's a sinner and ask for his forgiveness. Well, when our sins are forgiven, something else takes place. We are reconciled with God, our second point on the outline. Romans 5.10 says, For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Being reconciled to God means we're being reunited with God, just like in a marriage. We've heard of marriages that are having trouble and they separate. Sometimes a trial separation, sometimes it's separating, intending to divorce. 
But in some cases, it's, it seems to be more and more rare. But there seems to be a reconciliation. And the divorce does not go through. There was one place, I believe it was in Texas, if I'm not mistaken, where in a, in a town, the, they, the judge made a policy. I think he was probably the only judge in town, but he made a policy before he would grant any divorces, they had to go through marital counseling with the local pastor. Because I don't know how that will go across today. This was not too long ago, probably 15, 20 years that I read this. And he said the divorce rate in that jurisdiction went down dramatically. Because there was, they sat down, they began to work through, and there was what they called reconciliation. A reuniting with that one that you were alienated from. Well, when we sin, we're alienated from God. When, once our sins are forgiven, we can be reconciled or reunited with God. The anger that was between us is gone. We are children of wrath, the Bible says, and that's the wrath of God. If you want to understand more about the wrath of God, re read the book of Revelation. The tribulation is the, the day of wrath, when God will pour out his anger and wrath upon this world and upon sinners who had the opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as Savior and rejected him. Now, does that mean God no longer loves it? No, because many, many, many will be saved during the tribulation period, but under a much more difficult circumstance. But once we are forgiven and we're reconciled with God, then that anger is no longer against us. And thirdly there, because of Jesus, I now have free access to God. Before, we could not step into God's presence in the sense of walking in with our petitions and our prayers and having that daily fellowship with the Lord. Because to, to be in sin is to be alienated from him. He cannot stand or he will not tolerate sin. But the moment that sin is forgiven and taken away, we then have that access to the Lord. The, the sinner, some people say, does God hear the sinner's prayer? Yes, he does. He's aware of it, but will he answer it? The Bible says he will not hear him. The psalmist says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord does not hear me. So it will, it will impede our prayers. He, is he aware we're praying? Yes, he's aware of all things. But will he answer it? And the answer to that is no. One prayer that he will answer is the sinner's prayer of requesting forgiveness for his sins. Well, we see some other verses that we've listed there. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19. Or actually go back to yeah, 5, 18 and 19. It says, and all things... Or of God who hath reconciled us by himself, to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So why did God reconcile us? Not only did he save us and reconcile us to God by Jesus Christ but he gave us a ministry. To whom did he give them it? To pastors? To missionaries? No, to all those who have been saved by the grace of God and reconciled to God, they now have the ministry of reconciliation. And notice there at the end of the passage, the word of reconciliation. What is that? It's the scriptures. It's the gospel. All the world needs to hear it, and he has committed that to you and I who know the Lord Jesus as our Savior to tell others about Christ and how they can be also reconciled to him. Colossians chapter 1 verse 21 says, And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through the death, through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. I want you to think about that. In order for us to be made acceptable, to be reconciled, and to go into the presence of the Lord, something had to change in us. God didn't change. He's unchanging. His standard does not change. The, work to the world today and the church today appears to be seeking, okay, we're going to make God a little less stuffy and a little less intolerant and a little less judgy. And we're going to bring, tone the scriptures down a little bit so we don't offend the sinners so they'll come to church and get saved and stay in church. Folks, that's wrong. That is not a church. 
A church is where we go and we magnify Jesus Christ and we become more and more like him by the association, by our participation in the body of Christ. We don't try to bring God down to our level. It's what he did, but what did he do in Christ? Is that he made us holy. That means set apart. He made us unblameable. You said, wait a second, does that mean I know I didn't sin? I did not do the bad things I did? Yeah, I did. The Apostle Paul could not go back on the things that he had done before he got saved. And he was a, pretty, he was a Pharisee, very religious, very dedicated, very committed to what he thought was right. But he was lost. Remember there in the book of Acts? In fact, the day he met with the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, he was carrying letters to put Christians in jail. Some of them perhaps to be killed for their faith and confession of Christ. Imagine all those things that he carried with him after he got saved. That didn't go away in the sense that they, that did happen. But God changed him. He made him holy. He made him unblameable. Never again would those charges be brought up against him by God. And unreprovable. Once we are in Christ and our behavior is that that pleases the Lord, God is not going to reprove us for that. As long as it's in his sight. It's by his standard, not by ours. So we have been reconciled. Hebrews 10, 19 through 22. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Now I want you to think about this statement. We've studied the tabernacle, the Pentateuch, and how God in the tabernacle, which was designed from a pattern from heaven, you have the outer courtyard where the sacrifices were made, but then you enter to the holy place where the priests would do their work. But then you had the holy of holies, the holiest place, which is where the presence of God was. And no man was to enter there. The high priest entered once a year on the Day of Atonement. Only once. And Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews is saying, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. And I've read historians, you know, Jewish historians, who've written that on that day when the high priest would go into the holy of holies to put the blood there on the mercy seat, on the Ark of the Covenant, they would tie a rope to his ankle that should for any reason God become displeased with him and strike him dead, no one could go in after him, but they would pull him out by that rope. So even the high priest, the one designated by God, is the only one that could enter on that one day per year. Do you think he went in real boldly? That he went in because at that point, the, sac the sacrificial sac sacrifices of the lambs only covered the sins. They did not take them away. But now in Christ, look, look at that phrase. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest. But we're doing it by whom? By the blood of Jesus. Not the blood of animals. It says, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to the true, with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Who am I in Christ? In Christ I am a priest that can walk straight into the very throne room of God and lay before him those things that are, that are rejoicing in my heart, the praises. I can lay before him the things that are weighing in our hearts, our prayer requests. We couldn't do that before. So we can do boldly that which even the high priest would do with great fear and trembling back in the Old Testament days. But one more thing let's look at here in our time left. I am rescued. There's nothing like when you are, if, you, if you've ever been in a pool or in a lake and you couldn't touch bottom and you couldn't swim very well and all of a sudden you begin to panic because you go down, you get water in your mouth and start coughing and a panic sets in, doesn't it? And then someone reaches out and helps you and picks you up or saves you, rescues you. 
And that's sort of what the Lord Jesus did for us when we trusted Christ as Savior. Matthew 20, verse 28, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. See, the penalty for our sin was that we had to shed our blood, and if we shed our blood, it couldn't be satisfactory to God because we had sinned. So the Son of Man, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, came and he offered his innocent, sinless blood in our stead and therefore made that ransom for all those who will simply believe on him and confess him. 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. We have been rescued. We were on our course to an eternity in a place called hell. With no recourse, with no hope whatsoever by our own measure. Because we have seen, we looked at Sunday a little bit there in Revelation chapter 20 verses 11 to 15. The resurrection of the, the evil ones. The ones who have, did not receive Jesus Christ. And those are going to be judged by their works. And there is not one of those judged by their works that will ever go into eternal life. They all end in the lake of fire there in Revelation 20, 15. So what we find here is that because he has redeemed us and he has rescued us, I've been rescued from a life-threatening situation. That's not just physical life. That is eternal life. Jesus paid the ransom for my life with his own life. And thirdly, sin no longer holds my life hostage. I no longer live in fear of death. I no longer live in fear of hell. I no longer live in fear of uncertainty of what will take place after I leave this world. Because when we leave this world, which is not my home as a believer, we know there's a home not built with hands. The Lord Jesus has prepared that a place for us. He promised that in John 14, it's awaiting us and we, don't want, we can no longer be held hostage by COVID, by any other threat to the life of a believer. But well, one more here, I think we can get through this. I am redeemed. Redeem is when something is paid or purchased. And to be redeemed means that we had a debt that we could not pay. And unless someone came and redeemed that and purchased us, that we would be in trouble. Look there at Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the, until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. The moment we got saved... Here in the church age, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within the believer, does he not? Romans 8 and 9 says, If any man have not the Spirit of God, he is none of his. So if you don't have the Spirit of God indwelling you today, that means you're not a born-again believer. It's that simple. And the Bible says that our, the Holy Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are a child of God. So if you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit. He indwells you. And he is, he is that... that uh, the word that he used here in Ephesians 1, 14, he's the earnest. He's like that, that guarantee that Jesus is indeed going to fulfill what he promised he would. At the moment of salvation, we were redeemed. And we were given the Spirit of God as, a, as a, an earnest, as a promise, as a deposit, so to speak, of what he will do the moment we step out of this life into eternity which says here, and this says, until the redemption of the purchased possession, when Jesus will come back for his own. When will that happen? Could be today. If it does, the dead in Christ, they're going to rise first, and they, we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds, and forever we will be with the Lord. So I have my life debt covered, and my future holds an inheritance from God. Not only have we been saved from hell, we have been saved to God, to a, an eternity with God, to a home in heaven. 
There, the second point, my life is no longer a worthless debt to sin. What were we before Christ? All our good works before being saved, the Bible says, are as filthy rags. They're useless. They're worthless. But once we are in Christ, he will use, in fact, Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 tells, how, tells us how we are saved by grace through faith. But then verse 10 says we are saved unto what? Good works. That he has foreordained that we should walk in them. We're not saved by good works. We're saved for good works. Once we're saved, we can then do the works that will please the Lord. Until then, we can't. And then there, the third point, I now look forward to rich meaning and purpose in God's future plan for me. Before we stood, as all religions of the world stand, in great fear and trembling, what is God going to do to me when I leave this life? When I stand before the judgment seat, you know, before we're saved, we're not going to the Bema seat. That's for believers. We're going before the great white throne judgment there in Revelation 20, 11 to 15. And the great fear and trembling to those who do not believe in salvation through, by grace through faith in Christ, then it depends on their works. And even evangelical groups who teach this, you ask them, if you died right now, where would you go? I hope I go to heaven. Don't you know? Oh, we can't know. I'm quoting dozens of times that I've, I've witnessed to people from these faiths, how they respond. In fact, I was, I've told you the story before about being there in Guaraituba, in just on the outskirts of Curitiba, Brazil. We had started the Emmanuel Church there in the neighborhood, and as we were witnessing and inviting people to church, I met with right outside of a of a church that they will call themselves a sister church. We're Christians. We preach the gospel. We believe in Jesus. But he was handing out tracts and I was handing out. So we exchanged tracts. And I said, oh, brother and this. And I said, I said, you call me brother. I said, tell me how you came to Christ. Oh, well, I was baptized and I do this and I do that. And I said, well, let me, tell me, let me ask you this question. If you die right now, where would you spend eternity? And I just handed him a tract. This title was, Where Will You Be Five Minutes After You Die? He said, Oh, I hope I'll be in heaven. And I asked him, I said, You don't know? He said, No, oh, we can't know. And then I looked at him and I said, What if I told you I do know? Oh, you can't do that. That would be arrogant. And I said, Well, I'm here to tell you with all confidence that I do know that I would be with the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, you can't say that. I said, yes, I can. Not because of what I am worth, not because of my merits, not because of any authority I have, but because of what Jesus Christ said. Through his word, the Bible says to be absent from the body for the believers to be what? Present with the Lord. It is a blessed hope, a blessed assurance. It is an unremovable promise that God gave to every believer. We saw John chapter 5, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, what? If any man will believe on me, no, hear my words and believe on him that sent me, what? Hath now. And the tense in the verb is so much more rich in the Greek language than in English. Because it means it's something that happens at a point in time and the results abide from then on. You have everlasting life. You shall not, just in case you are in doubt, in the future, you will not come into condemnation. But you have, past tense, passed from death to life. It's already been accomplished. And I told him, I said, if I don't believe what Jesus told me, then he's a liar. I'm making him a liar. So I can only believe what Jesus told me. And today I have received Jesus Christ as my Savior. And therefore, based on the authority of Jesus Christ and his word, if I die right now, I'm going to heaven. I have been redeemed. He still couldn't conform to that. He still just couldn't accept that. No, we have to do this and do that and do this. And as long as we stay in the church and we do this, then if our good outweighs our bad, then we might get to heaven. No, folks, we have been redeemed. Colossians Chapter 1, verse 14 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood. Not through our efforts, not through our church, not through our, 
our system of whatever we want to create, and there are many of them out there, but it's through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Titus 2.14, who gave himself for us that, we might re that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, ze people zealous of good works. Hebrews 9.12, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Eternal redemption. We cannot be taken out of the hand of God. And then one more, 1 Peter 1, 1, 1.18 says, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, such as silver and gold, from your vain conversation, that means your walk, your life, received by tradition from your fathers. No one is redeemed by their works, by tradition, by religion. We're redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's who we are in Christ. You are forgiven, you are reconciled with God, you are rescued or saved, and you are redeemed. And we'll continue on here the next time. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we thank you for who you are. And Lord, thank you for the privilege of knowing who we are in Christ. Lord, as we look at the identity crisis around us in the world today, not only personal, but in terms of peoples, in terms of nations, in terms of ethnicity groups, but Lord, religiously, the world is so confused because it simply will not acknowledge who created them, who sustains them, and one day who will judge them. I pray that beginning here, as we begin to understand who we are and then how we got here, Lord, you will enable us to more effectively show the world around us, those who do not know you, how they can know precisely who they are in Christ and how they can become a child of God. Apply your word now to our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.